Um, as we uh, prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, um, I hope um, this meditation will be um, a bit of an encouragement and a blessing, but also a challenge and uh, ultimately uh, point to our source of, of hope. Um, it's kind of a, a confluence of several different events that uh, occurred over the past um, few weeks or so. Um, the first is a conversation I had with someone uh, um, outside of uh, the GP body uh, concerning our current situation and uh, what our future might look like moving forward. And um, I, I, I trust the, the heart of this individual, so I believe that this was meant uh, not to be discouraging, but as a kind of a to be forewarned, as to be forearmed, um, you know, in Je Jesus in the in the New Testament talks about the idea of that um, when we when we decide to follow Christ, that we need to count the cost, and so I, I think that is what was intended here, and this is what they said. They said that they said remember that it's easier to give birth than it is to raise the dead. In other words, it's easier to birth a dream and implement it than it is to resurrect one that has seemingly died. But thankfully, we serve a God who can raise the dead, amen? Um, and the second is a, is a song that I, I ran across within the last week, and it's called Rattle, which when I saw the name, I'm like, Rattle, what, what is that about? But, um, and then the next is, is someone that I heard speaking about Ezekiel 37 and the Valley of Dry Bones, which is what the song Rattle is about. Um, it's based on that. And um, I'm just going to read a few before I read I, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel 37, I'm just going to re read you f some of the lines from the song. And it starts out with, Saturday was silent, surely it was through, but since when was, has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? This is the sound of dry bones rattling, this is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just ask the man that was thrown on the bones of Elisha if there's anything that he can't do. Just ask the stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden what happens when God says move. So I'm just going to read from Ezekiel 37. And Ezekiel writes, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out of the... He, excuse me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. So they've been there a while. Um, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to, to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, 
Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then my people, then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. And as we come to time of communion and we, and we take the, the bread um, that represents Christ's body and we, we take the, the cup that represents his blood, just remember that all of us, all of us without Christ are dead. Um, we're just rattling bones. Um, but, but Christ came and he died and he rose again so that we might be risen again and that he might take us home one day to be with him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who can deliver, who can heal, who can restore. You can do anything you want to. Um, I thought this week about the idea of, of a body being resurrected, but you created life and you can take dry bones disjointed things that are falling apart and broken and you can put them back together and you can give them life so this morning as we come to this time of communion just pray that we help us to thank you and to trust you and to believe in the power because you you tell us in your word that we have within us if we trust you the power that raised Christ from the dead. So let's, let us this morning um, trust you for that. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm just going to take a wild guess and say that there are things that scare you. Except maybe Chuck. I don't know. Chuck's probably just fearless. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anybody not afraid of anything? No? Remember when you were a kid? Oh, all right. We got a brave soul over here. You should come up here and talk. You should be the one to do this because <laughs> it's funny when you're a kid, you know, I mean, and as an adult too, like you don't ever want to be people to think you're scared, right? You want to be brave, like nothing phases you. You get to being a teenager and everybody's terrified of what everybody else thinks about them and thinks that they're the only one, you know, and it, but even as an adult, I don't know, do you just get more afraid as you get older? You just kind of know what the stakes are more and more? I don't know, things that, that bothered you when you were a kid that you worried about as a kid, you realize they're not a big deal, but that's partly because now you're scared of things that are a big deal, you know? It's like, man, and to think, to think my biggest fear used to just be that somebody at school would laugh at me. You know, I mean, not that I want that now, but like, hey, that's, that wouldn't be so bad. Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of don't get away with, from fear. We just kind of change what we're afraid of, don't we? Right? We're, we're afraid of things like work situations not working out. We're afraid of, of family issues. We're afraid of what's happening in the world, in our country. There's a lot of things that scare us, aren't there? I'm, uh, so, so... In my day job, I work at a bank, and uh, so my, my branch is closing down in, uh, in September. And uh, I'm not going to say what bank I'm at, but um, basically we're, you know, my bank is merging with another bank, and so they're going to be consolidating branches, and so a lot of branches are going to close. Some new ones are going to open and you know, integrate and stuff, and they're still figuring out what all that's going to look like. And you know, the, the company is trying to like leadership is trying to sound real positive about how many people are going to get to keep their job. You know, it might be a different job. You might be at a new location, but they're going to 
you know, like, hey, we've been through this before. We've had really good success at getting people placed, you know, and it doesn't really stop people from panicking, though. <laughs> Anybody been through a merger at work before? Yeah, somebody, somebody was telling me this week that um, they were previously at a work, a manager at a bank that was going through a merger, and the managers, the branch managers were aware that the merger was happening, but they didn't know, like, are branches going to close? Are people going to get let go? They didn't know, have answers on that yet. Well, so they had this big meeting where they gather all the branch managers in this big room, and they go up, you know, somebody goes up to the front and just starts reading off names. And if you're on this list, you go stand over here on the left. And if you're on this list, you go stand here on the right. And then once everybody's divided into these two groups, they say, okay, you guys on the left, you're going to go down the hall to this other room, and, you know, and somebody's going to talk to you down there. And then everybody else that's still here, you stay put. Okay, once they're out of the room, it's like, so then they just stand up and say to everybody who was on the right who's still standing there. So, okay, so if you're in this group, that means you no longer have a job. Like, oh, thanks for that. Thanks for treating us like, you know, cattle or something. Goodness. Yeah, it gets brutal, doesn't it? It gets brutal. I mean, there's, there's, so it's not like, you know, so a lot of people at work just seem to be very, very anxious about what's happening. You know, like I was, I was talking to one guy recently that, that he already, already got a job at another bank. Like as soon as they first announced that a merger would happen, you know, and that, that there might be the possibility that branches could close down, he instantly like started looking for other jobs. He's like, no thank you. You know, but it's, it's been interesting to see how different people react based on what scares them. You know, because I've, I've got coworkers who are really afraid that they're going to lose their job and they're not sure what they're going to do. And I've got other coworkers that, are, that actually, they were more afraid of being stuck at their current job. So this is kind of like a blessing. They're like, oh, finally, <laughs> you know, at least I know that by September I won't have to work here anymore. You know, <laughs> which, good for you, okay, you know. Uh, but it, it's hard, you know, we go through things like that. It, it's things that might give us certainty have a way of just crumbling, right? Things just can happen so fast with no warning, with no, you know, no advance warning that, that it's gonna happen. But we worry about things, don't we? We worry about our jobs, we worry about our income. Anybody been through a period of time where you did not have income and you didn't know where you were gonna get it? Yeah, I've, I've been there. Kendra and I had a couple of months at one point in time where we did not have any income at all, and it was a full-time job trying to find a job, you know. We've been there. We, we're, we're worried about our families. As a parent, I worry about my kids all the time. Now, but I just want to take a survey here. When your kids get older, do you ever stop worrying about them? For, for those of us that have kids, right, even if you don't, there are probably kids that you still worry about, even if it's just kids these days, right? But like. Do you, you never really stop worrying about them, do you? Now, now, question, if you're a grandparent in the room, do you worry as much about your grandkids as you do your kids? Yeah, okay. Do you, do you worry about what your kids are doing to your grandkids and how they're raising them? Yeah. That's a whole other category. Like, I'm worried about you, I'm worried about you, I'm worried about you because of you, you know? There's a lot of reasons to worry in life, aren't there? We worry about our country, right? Is, have you ever noticed how every single election, both parties are convinced that this is the election of our lifetimes? I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay it. It's not like important stuff doesn't happen in Washington, but like, and in our states and you know, local governments too, but like, have you noticed how every single election is all or nothing? And how often do we think that way? Have, uh, have you ever seen somebody get elected that you didn't want get elected? Anybody? <laughs> like, like every time? Said uh, somebody in the front row here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we're still alive, right? I mean, it, bad things have happened, good things have happened. The world hasn't ended yet anyway, right? All the ones that were supposed to be the Antichrist, here we are, <laughs> you know, it's still... Jesus hasn't come back yet. There hasn't been any kind of rapture or anything yet, you know? All the, all the predictions of when that was supposed to happen, right? I mean, that's, that's something we've been doing for years, right? It's Christians saying, this is it. There's never been a time like the time right now. The world's going to end. It's like, 
yeah, Christians have always been saying that. We just kind of have a tendency, um, you know, I, I, believe, I believe it was C.S. Lewis that, that coined the term chronological snobbery, right? That, that we just, people have this tendency to think that whatever age they, you know, that they happen to live in, that that's the most dramatic age that nothing like this has ever happened before. And we always think that about the time we live in. And I'm not saying that that's not true in some cases. It's just like, I don't know, is it true in our case? There have been a lot of people that thought that before us. And I don't know, at least uh, there, there are things that could be better. There are things that could be worse, right? My, my point in saying this is not to tell you what you should be more afraid of. My point in saying this is just like, we tend to fear things. And sometimes it's for good reason. And sometimes maybe it's not. But there are just a lot of things that keep us up at night, aren't there? And yet, you and I in this room, listening online right now, we ought to know better, shouldn't we? I feel like uh, this, this series in Exodus, I feel like I'm pretty much just saying the same thing every week. Which is like everybody else that thinks they're, you know, that they're God, they're not God, actually turns out God is God. And he's going to show you. And guess what? If he's on our side, then we don't have to be scared of anything. I feel like that's what I've been saying for weeks now. And, and I, I almost like, you know, when I'm getting ready for this, I, I think like, man... I can't just say that again. Like, I've already said it so many times, you know? Like, I, I, I want to do something original here. I want to do something different. And, and Exodus doesn't, whoever wrote Exodus doesn't see it that way. You know, Moses or whoever. It's like, no, they, they pretty much just want to say the same thing over and over and over. Like, the gods of Egypt are nothing. Pharaoh is nothing. Yahweh is God. End of story, right? So, like, pick your side. Don't be an idiot, Right? That's kind of that's kind of been the ongoing ongoing theme over and over. And guess what? That's going to be exactly what we're going to talk about again this morning. But maybe there's a reason we need to keep hearing it. So if you'll if you'll turn with me in your Bibles, we're we're just going to, you know, we've been dealing with kind of some long sections at times, so I haven't like read all the passage, like I've just kind of little snippets and talked through it. This morning we're just going to read through the story we're looking at. We're just going to read right through it. And the first thing I want you to think about as we go into this, remember the context here. Where, where did we leave off last week? Passover, yeah. So, so the Israelites, are they out of Egypt now? Well, kind of. <laughs> They're on their way out, right? They, they left the land of Goshen where they were living, right? And now what? That's where we left off is they're out of here. But now what? Now where are they going? Now what's going to happen next? Well, you've seen Ten Commandments. You know where, what happens next. Or uh, Prince of Egypt or, you know, Sunday school lessons or whatever. I'm, I'm assuming that probably everybody listening right now knows where this goes next, right? It's going to be the Red Sea, right? Okay, so let's, let's start reading. But as we do, I want you to pay attention to what is the Israelites' attitude right out the gate here? What are their expectations here, all right? So we're going to start reading in Exodus chapter 13, starting in verse 17. Exodus 13, starting in verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Now, why would God think that? <laughs> if, if you've read the rest of Exodus, you know exactly why, right? So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. They, I mean, in the Hebrew, it's really like talking about like they're in, the, in divisions, like in, in battle formation, right? So like they are walking out ready for battle, right? And yet here's God saying like, I know they're not ready for battle, so let's avoid battle here, right? So, so just, to, just to make a note of what we're talking about here, they're in the land of Goshen. It's in like northeastern Egypt. You know how, like, even, even if you're not super familiar with this geography, you know how there's that little part where Africa connects to the Middle East, right? And you've got what we call the Sinai Peninsula that's kind of this little triangle of land in between. I mean, I say little. It's little if you're looking on a globe. It's not little in real life. It's a pretty big desert. But, um, but like... The, that's like the connector between, you know, as far as land that is above the water between... The, the continent of Africa and the continent of Asia, right? Where the Middle East connects. Okay, so Goshen is like pretty close to that. They're in northeast Egypt. They're right up kind of by that, the Mediterranean Sea there. They're pretty close to it. 
And also, you know, where the water, how far the Mediterranean came and how much land was above water has changed since this happened. And so that, you know, that throws archaeologists off a little bit trying to figure out where everything is. But like, they're kind of in northeast Egypt. The natural way to go is, is northeast right along the coast of the Mediterranean. Because that's the straight path to Israel, to, to the land of Canaan, to the promised land where they're going, right? Where modern day Israel is, it's right there on the Mediterranean, on the east edge of the Mediterranean Sea. So like the best bet is either take a boat and it's a straight shot or walk and like you're just going to walk right along, right along the coast. And you know what? There's a natural trade route that goes right there. It's the natural way to go. Actually, there's, you know, for a long time there was a railroad, not back then, <laughs> you know, they didn't hop on a train at this point. Like a, like a, you know, 600,000 hobos just hopping up. But like, um, th there's, you know, but at one point in time, it's not used anymore, but for a long time, there was a, a, a railroad running from Cairo all the way up to Damascus, right, in Israel. And it just went, it went right along this route. It's just the natural route. It's where a trade route was. Makes a lot of sense, right? God says, nope. Because if you go that way, you're going to encounter people that are not going to be happy to see this many people just walking up with no explanation. And uh, so we're, we're not going to go that way. We're going to go a really roundabout way through the desert. So we're, we're actually going to go south to some degree. And we're going we're gonna to at some point cross some water into, like I want you to go down by this body of water. Now is it the Reed Sea? Is it the Red Sea? You know, that's a whole other. Where, where all the geography is here is a little confusing. We're not going to get into it. But, um, but God basically wants him to take a roundabout route starting farther south going through the desert, right? So anyway, so, um, so that, we'll, we'll get into that more in a moment, but let's, let's continue reading here. In verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Anybody remember Joseph's bones? Right, right at the end of Genesis? Joseph being in the promised land, knowing the promises that God has made to his, his father and grandfather and great-grandfather Abraham, right, that, that his people are going to dwell in this land, and well, here, here we all are in Egypt. So Joseph says, don't bury me here. Carry my bones back up to the land God promised us, right? Here's Moses following through on that. Hey, that's cool. All right, so Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of cloud by night left its place in front of the people. So that should be a pretty clear sign that God is with you. Like, I'm going to follow the giant fire thing that's telling us where to go. You know, like, clearly whoever's making that happen is in charge around here. We're just going to do what they say, right? Um, but that's, that's pretty cool. Also, traveling at night was not much of an option back then. Unless you had a really clear sky and the full moon, and, like, so you had some okay lighting. It just didn't make a lot of sense to travel at night, right? But they can actually move kind of quick because they can do some traveling at night or by day, just whatever works for them. All right, so picking up in chapter 14 here. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi ha -hiroth, which we have no idea where that is between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea. Um, i got to turn my page here. Directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. Right? So Pharaoh's going to think, what are they doing? They're just kind of like walking along the edge of the border of the desert, not really sure where to go. Right? That's what Pharaoh's going to think. Um, and, and it turns out God is right. That's kind of what Pharaoh thinks. Um, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, or rather that I am Yahweh, right? The all caps Lord there, that I am Yahweh. So the Israelites did this. That's always nice to see. You know, like kind of like last week when it says God, God tells the Israelites to do something and it says, and the Israelites did it. Like, wow, good job, guys. All right, so when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, fled, that's an interesting choice of words. It's like, no, you, you drove them out. You wanted them gone, right? Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. 
really? Like, your firstborn son just died. It's been, what, maybe a couple of days? And you're already like, man, what a mistake. What were we thinking? Should have kept him. Right? Remember, too, like that word services I'm reading out of the NIV. This is the same word that's been used, serve or worship. Right? It's where God has been saying repeatedly that the Israelites are serving the Egyptians as slaves, but instead I want them to leave Egypt and go serve me, go worship me as Yahweh, right? So he's like, hey, we lost these slaves. We lost all the stuff they're doing. Well, who's going to do it now? I don't want to. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. I love that it starts out with he took his 600 best chariots. Oh, and also all the chariots, like even the ones that weren't the best. He took those too. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. Marching out boldly in Hebrew, marching out with their hands held high. Now, what kind of emotion are you feeling if your hands are held high? I'm so depressed. Why doesn't everybody like me? Right? You don't put your hands up when you're depressed, when you're sad. I mean, maybe if you're like in the cartoons, if you're scared and you're running away and, you know, with your hands up. What, what emotions might be happening with your hands held high? Woohoo! Woo yeah! Victory! Charging into battle, right? That's a, that is a victorious and confident pose, isn't it? With your hands held high. Right? So, so they walk out with their hands held high. They walk out. They seem kind of pumped, kind of excited here. All right, so they're marching out boldly. Picking up in verse, um, verse 9 there, the Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, all the king's horsemen and all the king's men, pursued the Israelites and, and overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Hahiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians. You've got to love the way that's phrased. They're just minding their own business. They're setting up camp. They look up, and there's the Egyptians. Look at that. Marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. That's, a, that's the right response. Yeah, um, a little bit scary. Crying out to God is good. We've seen that that pays off, right? They did that before, and God got them out of Egypt. So if they do it this time, maybe he'll help them out again. All right, they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? Wow, okay, guys. What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Now, do you remember them saying that? That's not quite how it went down. There was a point, right, where things got... You know, Pharaoh first confronts, or, or Moses and Aaron first confront Pharaoh and say, you know, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And he takes away the straw that they used to make the bricks. You remember that? Right? And then there is that point where, like, the Israelite kind of managers of, of the work, like, go up to Moses and Aaron and are like, guys, what are you doing to us? Like, forget about it. This was, this was not worth it. Right? So there is kind of a moment like that. But other than that, we don't really have them saying, like, yes, we would rather stay in Egypt than leave. Right? And actually, you know, right now, they, they, uh, just a moment ago, did, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't it like two seconds ago that they had their hands held high and they were all excited? Right? Maybe their arms are tired. All right, so they say it would have been better for us to, to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Now, when you put it that way, okay, I don't know which one's worse. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Wow, all right. Moses finally, like, has the right attitude. He doesn't even consult God first. But, like, wow, Moses is, like, giving him a pep talk. Like, this is not the scared Moses that we saw in front of Pharaoh a little while ago, right? The please send somebody else, Moses. You remember that, Moses? This is cool. Moses, is, Moses still has his hands held high. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. And Moses might be like, well, God, it wasn't me. Technically, you know, I, I vouched for you there. They were the ones crying out, you know, but God's talking in the collective sense here, right? Okay, but he says, he says, tell the Israelites to move on. 
raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. Right? This is important because God just put them in a position where they're stuck, they're cornered. Right? The Egyptians are coming at them from one side. On the other side is water. It is too much water to swim across. There are men, women, and children, and animals here, a lot of people. You're, you don't have time to make boats, right? Uh, this, this isn't going to work. They're kind of stuck. But God says that he's going to divide the water, right? I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Right? So, so God says, like, chill out. I've got this. Here's what we're going to do. Another miracle. This is going to be awesome. All right? So it says, then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved, uh, moved from in front and stood behind them, com coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so that neither went near the other all night long. Right? So God, God's presence has been leading them, has been standing in front of them, and now God's presence has moved in between as a wall to protect them. Nobody's getting through one way or the other, right? God is right in the middle. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That's got to have been cool. If you've ever seen the Prince of Egypt movie, they're like walking through the water and they can like see a whale swimming by. I don't know if there's whales in this body of water. I really doubt it's deep enough for whales exactly, but it's pretty cool, right? Uh, the Egyptians pursued them and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, right? That's, you know, shortly before dawn. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. Here's an extra element, right? He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. Uh, some, some translations, some, some versions of this will say he removed the wheels. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but, but if he removed the wheels so that they had difficulty driving, I'd say yes. I would say that's going to make it a little difficult. Uh, but, you know, I don't know how dry this ground is. Maybe they're getting stuck, but then don't the Israelites probably have carts or something? I don't know. Whatever the case... God is causing this to happen. That's the point, right? All right, so when the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt, right? The Egyptians are recognizing, oh, wait, guys, you remember how Yahweh beats us every time? Maybe let's get out of here while the getting's good. Well, it looks like it's too late. Um, in verse 26, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. I think it's interesting that God has Moses do this again, right? God could have just parted the waters, but he wants Moses to raise his staff and hold out his hand and stuff. And then, of course, it says all night, speaking of hands held high, like his arms are going to get tired. That's a long night of, you know, waving your arm over the sea. I don't know if he had to stand there the whole time, right? But now God actually wants Moses to do this again. Wave your hand over the, over the water and it's going to come back down. Right? And, and so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak, right? So this went on all night, and now at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, Yahweh saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. Do you need any more reassurance at this point? All right, you, you want to, like, next time you're scared, next time you think I'm not going to go through, let me give you a very powerful visual reminder here. Let me just let you walk around, walk along and see the dead bodies of the mo one of the most powerful militaries on earth, if not the most powerful military on earth, lying there dead on the shore. And you did not have to lift a finger. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. 
Wow. Wow. Can you imagine? What a dramatic night, huh? Like, by this point, I would just be exhausted. What would you do at this point? I'd say, guys, can we just stop and take a nap now? Like, let's get away from the dead bodies. They're going to start stinking. You know, let's, let's move on a little ways, and let's uh, set up camp again, and let's just have an, a quick nap before we have to walk through the desert anymore. But no, here's, here's what the Israelites do. And this is probably the most rational response, given who God is and what he has done for them. They break out into song. Now, I don't know if Moses, like, wrote this song beforehand. Um, if so, he had very great foresight um, with some of the things he's going to sing about. Also, you know, the way they did music back then, it, music is different in different cultures. You can have a style of music that's more improvised, and, you know, it, it, not everything has to rhyme, and, you know, so it, it just works differently. You can improvise a little better. So I don't know what's going on here, but this is the song they sing. Let's read this together, picking up in chapter 15. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Yahweh, was majestic in power. Your, your right hand, Yahweh, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the water pi waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. I'm sorry, just the, the blast of your nostrils sounds like a sneeze to me. But that's not what, he, that's not what they meant. Uh, the enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them, I will draw my sword, and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations, oh, this doesn't end here. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia, that's the Philistines. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as a stone until your people pass by, Yahweh, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Yahweh, where you, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. Yahweh reigns forever and er ever. And then just a, one little summary statement here. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then, then this is cool. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, that's also Moses' sister, remember? She's the one that followed along when Moses was a baby in the basket, right, in the river. Um, so Miriam took a timbrel, that's like a tambourine, in her hand, and all the women followed her. With timbrels and dancing, Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord. These are the first couple lines of the song that we just read. Sing to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. So I think that implies they're going to be singing the rest of this song too. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. And you know what's crazy? This is not the craziest thing they've ever seen God do. It's, it's like every time they seem to have like, we're going to see this as we keep reading. They seem to have no memory. No memory at all. Like, whatever happens, the next day, it's like it's over. The Egyptians, too, for that matter. Nobody in this, in this book seems to have a good memory except for God. You know, God who's saying, I remember the covenants I made and all this stuff. You think I don't remember. You're the one who won't remember. Why don't they remember? But you know what? We all know that we're all the same, don't we? I'm just like that. I can be praising God one moment, and then I'll go home and I'll eat a meal, and my mood will change because of the food I ate. 
and I'll, I'll go to bed too late, and I'll wake up too early with the baby screaming, that's going to change my mood. And I'm going to forget whatever happened yesterday. Right? I'm going to go to work. Something good will happen. Something bad will happen. We are just, we are just so fickle. Like our moods just change all the time, don't they? We, we are so prone to forget the things God has done. We're so prone to forget how he has taken care of us in the past. We worry. Can you believe that we worry about money? Has God always provided for you? Is anybody, anybody here that you can say, God at some point stopped providing for me and it was done and I died. I starved to death. No, and you know what? There are people that starve to death. That's a real thing. But the point I'm making here is like, when we trust God, God makes promises to us, doesn't he? He makes promises that if we put our trust in him, he will look out for us. He doesn't promise it's going to be easy. He doesn't promise that we'll always have as much money or as much food as we like. He doesn't promise that there won't be Egyptian armies. What he does promise, though, is that he will fight for us when those armies come. He doesn't promise that there won't be a desert to walk through. But he gives us a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire to lead us. And when the armies come after us, he will move into position to protect us. Next week, we're going to see when they are in the desert, where there is no food and no water, God will find ways to provide. Ways that nobody could have seen coming. But God did. When we go through life, God never promised that life would be easy, that we wouldn't have problems. God never promised that there wouldn't be things to be afraid of. He just told us we don't have to be afraid of them. There will be scary things in your life. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. But you are not facing those things alone. You know, in, in our efforts to control the things around us, we get nervous about what's going to happen, and so we take action to try to protect ourselves from what we're afraid of. Sometimes we manipulate others and we use other people. Sometimes, sometimes we, we connive and we trick and we lie. Sometimes instead of waiting for God, we take matters into our own hands and we try to make it happen for ourselves and it doesn't work out. Sometimes when God promises, promises one thing and it's not working out, we say, you know what, I'll do my own thing instead. It's different, but I know that I'm going to do it. And I don't have to trust you. And it doesn't work out. What God does for the Israelites over and over and over again, over and over again, is he says, you don't have to be afraid because I've got you. You're going to be fine. I want to end with a story about Jesus. That's a good way to end, right? In Matthew chapter 15, or rather chapter 14 that is, Jesus and his disciples are in a boat. They're in the water, right? So, so Jesus was like going off by himself to pray, and then he kind of got interrupted. Um, but here they are. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just start reading in chapter four, Matthew 14, verse 20, starting in verse 22. And there's one specific line that I want to focus on here. We'll, we'll get there. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd, the crowd that they had, he had just done the feeding of the 5,000 here. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind against, was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear, which, you know, is a reasonable response to somebody walking on top of water. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Oh, so don't be afraid. So like there's like winds and stuff and like th these are not good conditions to be on a little boat out in this big lake. And there's somebody walking out to us on the water. It's probably a ghost, but the ghost says, hey guys, don't worry, it's just me. Don't be scared. But Peter, Peter, being Peter, he says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. I don't know where this idea is coming from. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. This is Peter 
putting himself in his own dilemma, right? Saying, God, hey, if it's you, I trust you. Let me walk out on the water with you. And Jesus says, okay. Yeah, if you want to, hop on out of the boat. If you're not chicken, you know. And Peter says, I'm not chicken. He jumps out of the boat. And this is cool. He's walking on water. And then what does he see? He stops looking at Jesus. He starts seeing the wind again. Now, this is a guy who grew up on this lake. He knows this lake. He grew up on this water. So, like, in theory, somebody who should be afraid of the water, like, would be him. If he, he's the one that if he starts panicking, you should panic. That's when you should panic, right? So, to be fair, like, he kind of knows this lake pretty well. But Jesus says, hey, you want to jump on the wa and walk out on the water and meet me out here? Like, go for it. And Peter does. And then he starts to look at the wind. He starts to think of all of the reasons that this shouldn't work. And he says, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus didn't hesitate. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And what does he say? Hey, you know what, Peter? You tried. You'll, you'll do better next time. Not quite. Hey, Peter, you moron. What were you thinking? You should have stayed in the boat. No, not quite. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Why did I doubt? We're walking on water. Like, this shouldn't be happening. What do you mean, why did I doubt? Jesus says, look, why on earth would you ever doubt? I'm right here. You see me here, like walking on the water. Why would you ever be afraid if I'm here? What do you ever have to be afraid of if I'm here? You, you with your tiny little faith. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. I don't know why God is letting this happen to you. I don't know why he is allowing whatever you're going through. I'm not going to say something as simple as like, well, God has a plan for this. Because, yeah, I think he does. But, but I think sometimes that can give the wrong impression. Like, oh, so God wanted this. This is what God likes. Not quite. But God is with you. And Jesus said to Peter, and Moses said on behalf of God to the people, hey, it's okay. You don't need to be afraid. Why would you be afraid? Do you see the pillar of cloud and the, the pillar of fire? Did you see the plagues when I, when I brought you out of Egypt? Did you see, did you see the way I, I told you exactly what to do with the Passover and everything went exactly like I said? Did, did you see what I did? Do you see that I'm with you right now? What is there to be afraid of? God is not going to take away everything that you could be scared of, but he is going to say you don't need to be scared. I don't know what the future holds for you and your family. I don't know what the future holds for, for you and your time and your work. I don't know what the future holds for this church. Man, we're going we're gonna to get to the Israelites walking around in the desert. That's going to feel relatable as a church, I think, right? Just kind of meandering in the desert, trying to figure out where to go next. I don't know where our country's headed. I'm not promising that anything is going to be easy, but I am promising that God is with you in this. And like Moses said, you don't have to do anything. Just stand firm. Just don't give up. Just don't be afraid. And let God do the fighting. Quit trying to fight all your own battles by yourself like you're on your own and nobody's going to help you. God has always been with you and he always will be with you. And if you will trust him, you might sink, but you might also get to walk on the water. You might get your feet wet, but you might walk through and see a wall of water on either side of you. It's not going to be an easy walk but it's going to be a walk that nobody has ever done before that could not have happened, could only happen by God's power. Because that water you're scared of, that's God's water. And he can do with it what he wants to. So don't be afraid. Stand firm. Let me pray for you. Lord, help us to not be afraid. God, you know how prone to fear we are. You created us, and, and you know us exactly the way that we are, Lord. But I pray that you would give us courage, not in our own strength, not from, from just being naive about the future, but courage 
and confidence because of who you are and what you have done and what you'll continue to do. Lord, whatever everyone in this room is going through, whatever they're afraid of, whether it's people, whether it's money, whether it's, it's death, whether it's the things that they have to do today and tomorrow, God, I pray that whatever we're anxious about here, that you would teach us to have courage and to trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.